All right, guys, we are live with TWIP episode 334. You guys ready to do the show? We're ready. All right, here we go. I'll kick, it off, with the, I'll kick it off with the intro, and we'll drop right into the news. Here we go. And welcome back to TWIP. I am your host, Frederick Van Johnson. Joining me today to discuss some of the topics that happened this week and some other cool things are Mr. Dan Ablin and Tristan Hall. Hey, guys, how you doing? Hey, Frederick. Hey, thanks, Tristan. I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Both of you guys haven't been on in a while. So, Dan, let, let's just start with you. Yeah. I know every time I talk to you, there's a bunch of new things that you're working <laughs> on. and Gotta like stay busy. Building studios and all. Yeah. <laughs> what, what's new this time? You built another uh, studio? Last time I was on, we just moved into the new studio, right, in June? Yeah. June or July, something like that, yeah. A uh, new book came out. A couple weeks ago uh, nice. with Petrit Press. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. Uh, number 15, and this one's an ebook, So it's my first non-printed book, so it'll be interesting. You've written um, 15 books, Dan? Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. Wait, 15 books. That's, find the that's, time? That's, that's a lot of bookage right there. Wow. Well, yeah, I mean, and, and a couple of them we had some contributing authors, but then with editing I felt like I rewrote them anyway. But um, yeah. But yeah, since uh, 96. <laughs> That's that's. I got crazy. a stack so you, of them so over there. So this next one, the one that you just published with Peach Pit, is an is it? It's your first ebook, right? So first tell me e-book. about that. How was uh, that? Yeah, this this one. I don't know. It just came out two weeks ago, so we'll see how it, the numbers are next month. But uh, it is composition for portraiture. Uh, so it's entirely a photography book, which is cool. cool. Um, and it is part of their Fuel brand ebooks. So they're very topic specific. Um, so they even have one on photographing beer and photographing your dog and. Nice. Uh, so mine's a little broader than that with just composition. Uh, some of the general principles plus a little bit more. Um, so I've been doing that. Uh, I've been doing some lecturing, consulting, still doing our 3D work and creative content and for marketing videos and things like that and doing high school seniors and family portraits here at the studio. So uh, it's, it's pretty busy, yeah. That's great. You're always you're always on fire. It's crazy. Got to. <laughs> got to these days. Yeah, I know. I know. you got to hustle. Well, cool. Yeah. Well, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. Also on the show here is Mr. Tristan Hall coming to us from South Africa. And as we record this, it is 4.07 a.m. And Tristan oh. is up just for twelve. So Tristan, thank you for, for waking up for us. Always a pleasure. So what's going on in your world? I know you're, you're the editor at Photo Comment Magazine. What else, what else is happening? Um, gee, it's been quite a bit of stuff. It's been a busy year for us. Yeah. Uh, magazine's doing well. We um, continue to, to see... Uh, we, in fact, we just had a photo and film expo um, here in South Africa. It was the fifth year, I think, of that it's been running. And it was fantastic to have everybody coming over and telling us how much they enjoyed it. And to find those people, some of them locally, some of them from abroad, who were out here to do workshops coming up to and saying, gee, when are you going to be on top again? And um, a lot of people recognized me from, from being here. So it was fantastic yeah. to, to be on the podcast um, and to meet meet all those people who realize, gee, somebody actually cares a little. Oh, they're just being polite about what I have to say. So, <laughs> but, or maybe um, both, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and, yeah, I've made the switch back over to uh, Sony NEX. Obviously, you know, in my past, I, I worked for Sony, and I kind of was there just as they were getting ready to introduce NEX. Um so yeah, um, you know, spent a f- so you're about moving, eight months moving of this back year. to Sony f- to the NEX from what? What was your primary before that? Well, for about eight months of this year, I've had a Canon 650D. I think over there it's a Rebel T4 or T5. I'm not sure. Um, and I got it simply because you know, from a video perspective, we had implemented uh, the EOS 5D Mark II, and I thought, well, getting the second body as a Canon body to make use of the lenses and whatever, and I barely used the camera in eight months. I did not enjoy it. I missed my electronic viewfinder from mm-hmm. shooting on the NEX7, and um, yeah, there was, there's a lot of things that I just uh, I missed about it, and so I traded that all in and got myself an NEX6, uh, um, and at the moment I'm busy playing with uh, two of the, the, the two Zeiss lenses for the NEX system. The um, the Tuit lenses, the 12mm and the 32mm. Um, they're quite 
quite nice lenses. The, the only weakness that they have is they don't support the hybrid detect focusing system um, in the NEX6. It's purely contrast detect. So it's a little bit slow. You see it moving backwards and forwards. And, yeah, doing um, a little hunting. Yeah, just a little bit. It, it, I must be honest, it doesn't... It's not that it... I can't call it hunting. Not like the Canon EOS M hunted. Um, it it literally it, it like goes backwards and forwards and it and then it locks. Whereas the EOS M kind of slowly would go past your subject and come back and just when you thought it would lock on, it would go again. And <laughs> so it it was actually one of those cameras where literally 15 minutes after using it, I put it away to, and I, I'd done enough to write the review. It was just uh, that frustrating. So you're um, so then so, you're back you're back to mirrorless then. That's interesting. Yes. That's an interesting sort of. Full circle, you did. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I just I miss that electronic viewfinder way too much. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's hard to go me, back. That's it's hard to go cool. back, right? Yep. Right. So. Well, cool. Well, welcome back. Welcome back to the show. It's good to have you back on again. Thank you. All right, guys, and uh, before we continue, just a quick note. We're going to put a link to this particular story uh, in the in the blog post for this episode. But came across my desk a little bit earlier today. Um, it was a uh, basically an email from the PACA, and it was regard to Microsoft and its Bing search engine. And it looks like basically they're alleging that Microsoft is encouraging the lifting of images uh, for placement into Microsoft Office documents with no apparent apparent regard for copyright concerns. In fact, they give you sort of a step by step process of how to right click. Shocker. Copy it <laughs> and put it into your document, and all the metadata gets stripped from it. <laughs> so, so um, yeah. So we haven't dug deeply into it. So we're gonna. I just wanted to highlight it on the on the show here and draw some attention to it, and then we're gonna link to all the articles that sort of go into what's going on, and then in a future episode we'll dive deeper into this. If in fact Microsoft hasn't corrected this, so scary stuff. Dan, did you see did you see this article at all? No, I heard about. It. I haven't read anything yet. I'm, I'm looking mm. at, your, at the show notes right here. I'm going to have to look into that. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. It's a little. Yeah, I mean, this is a. This is. We've talked about this on shows before. Just, just copyright and people using images, and mm-hmm. um, I still don't. You know, this is. <laughs> then when you get a big company like Microsoft saying, "Yeah, it's good, fine, go ahead." <laughs> oh well, I mean, when when Google did the whole drive thing with uh, was it with. Shutterstock or iStock photo that they they did the whole partnership to make certain images available that you know they did it through a stock agency people still got a little bit um, upset about about the price that was paid for it and I guess Microsoft is just saying well let's just create an upset regardless I mean it's what, yeah, what's I, the wonder, point to do yeah it? I wonder it's, if it's a marketing <laughs> plan that involves you know what let's just hire 12 or 13 lawyers put them in that room and if anybody <laughs> cries uncle yeah. we'll direct them to that office <laughs> and, it's, and it still just comes back to that same old thing which is you know if it's out online it's, it's not yours anymore yeah, you can yeah, fight as much. Yeah. I, have, I actually have a, a close friend here, a photographer. Um, somebody was actually taking her name entirely, and um, was and now was coming up in the Google searches. And when people would call, uh, she said, "Yes, that's me," and using her <laughs> images, and Jesus. you know, and it was a lot of lawyers and a lot of money, and she got taken care of. But I mean, it's just so it was like photographer uh, identity theft. So she stole the name kind of, and yeah. the images. Right? Yeah, exactly. Jeez. Yeah. So. Oh man, yeah. yeah you gotta be careful. That's uh, crazy. Yeah, you're right, Dan. You know, you, once it's online, it's yeah. uh, it's it's kind of out there, and it becomes a, a fight. A, a, I don't know if you want to say a losing battle, but it becomes a battle if someone infringes on your copyright. Yeah, and and I know we've talked about this before. Was a Google image search, um, which a lot of people don't know about still, where you can go to Google, go to the image search. There's actually a tutorial there, and you can drag and drop your own images right in there. And it will quickly search and show you if that's online anywhere else. Yeah. Have you used that? Is that does that? I work have for you? used that for so far. You know, haven't haven't found anything. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's it's it works. I'm almost afraid to look. I'm just because <laughs> like I don't have any time as it is. I'm like, oh geez, now I gotta hunt these people down that are stealing images. It's just ugh. Well, you know, the good thing is is that the photography community really stands together. And uh, as soon as something's stolen, I know some famous photographers like Sue Bryce and some others, um, right on Facebook, there are people that call them out and they just blast them away and all the other photographers band behind them and start sending notes. And within within a day or so, that site is taken down. So yeah, and they yeah. always blame 
Uh, oh, my webmaster put it up. Uh, I know. I know. <laughs> I love that. Oh, it wasn't my fault. It was my my social media specialist yeah. or or something like that. Yeah. And when the when the internet or photographers on the internet in in particular band together, man, it's like. It's like that scene out of the old Frankenstein, right? Yep. <laughs> like yeah. pitchforks and torches, you know, and it's exactly uh, what it is. Yeah, they're all they're all kind of fighting and arguing, you know, and and secretly watching each other and competitive all day long. But then when something like that happens, they do bend together. Yeah, yeah, like a family. <laughs> Yeah, self self policing, but still scary. It's a scary world we live in. So we're going to be talking about that a lot yeah. in this uh, this particular episode. This the whole idea of cloud computing versus some other kinds of computing, and uh, you know the pluses and minuses and dangers and you know sort of the good things about it as well. But before we continue um, with this episode, I want to thank one of our sponsors for this week, and that's Audible.com. All right, guys. Let's jump into the news stories. Um, before, well, actually, before we do that, just I want to hit on a couple of things. One of them is from our friends over at Petapixel. They, there's a story that they posted recently. I, I think it was earlier this week um, that basically stated 50% of newspaper photography jobs are gone. 50%. So the, in other words, photojournalism in general. If you look at photojournalism from the standpoint of being a newspaper photographer, sort of you know, taking magazine photography out of it because that represents an even smaller part of the pie. But looking yeah. at newspaper photojournalism, 50% is gone. So Tristan, l looking at this, we have the link in the show notes to this, looking at this, is, I'll just put a fine point on it, is photojournalism as we knew it, you know, growing up, is, you know, National Geographic, newspapers, you know, P Pulitzer Prize winning photographers, is that all gone? Is it all gone? And, I, and just sort of, you I don't know. think it's... I'm not so sure that it's all gone. I think the, the challenge that the industry is facing is, um, you know, the, 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 yes, there's less money to send photographers out on big assignments. Um, you know, there's... and, and long-term type of stuff. Um, I, I think part of it's also got to do with the kind of news that people are looking for. I'm not saying that that Instagram and you know mobile photography and that hasn't affected it. I think citizen journalism is it, it plays a very important role in terms of servicing the industry with news. I mean, this week we've seen um, quite quite a bit of interesting stuff in here in Johannesburg where you know we've got a particular suburb that that has a a fugitive some from some European country living in it, and he seems to everybody he seems to shake hands with dies somehow in a bomb blast or a shootout. What? On top. <laughs> it's quite quite what? impressive. Um, you know, yes, uh, I mean he got shot at by a car that had you know guns built into the bumper and all James Bond style movie type of thing. It, it's quite quite incredible. And and you know where we've had some of these stories breaking. Um, Images and that have come out from people online and and sharing that type of stuff through Instagram and on Facebook, um, you know, long before they can get any reporter there. And I think the 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 trick is that you know people want to know about that. They want to be able to see those images live and be a part of that. Mm -hmm. I think the the difficulty where the industry is facing it is in having that they've got less money to spend on having full time photographers to send out on assignments. Um, you know, and that that that's the sad thing. When you see a a photojournalist who goes and commits his spare time to shooting a documentary type image um, about, I don't know, we've had one recently which which we featured in the magazine of of street kids living in a sewer outside one of the the, the city's biggest shopping malls. Um, you know, and and the photographer goes and invests his time and puts his heart into it, and the newspaper either passes it up or you know if they publish it, they publish one or two small little pictures and, and put text all over it. And, and uh, yes, I think pure photojournalism from that point of view, um, you know, long-time story reporting where we're not just taking a, a snapshot to accompany the copy, that type of journalism is in threat of, of decline. But I am also encouraged to see how many of those photographers are going out there and shooting stories that matter to them and working through organizations that are, are there to promote photojournalism and creating that awareness for those stories. So yeah. is it? I, I wouldn't advise anybody to get into it as a profession um, unless they're really, really dedicated to the cause. If you think you're going to make money as a photojournalist, uh, you know, I, I think you, you, you don't 
really know what you're getting yourself in See, for. Those those words are really telling. I mean, those last words. If you, as the editor of Photo Comment, would not recommend that anyone go into the field of photojournalism expecting to make any money. Dan, would you agree with that? I mean, is it? Yeah, absolutely. I think I agree with everything Tristan said. Um, you know, unless unless they were sending you off to the Middle East or to a war zone, um, yeah, I would I would absolutely agree with that. But yeah. also add to that, you know, the diminishing photographers, all of everything Tristan said. But then think about the circulation of newspapers today, right. um, and where that's gone. And so you add that into the mix as well, and how many people get their news right on their phones like I do and everybody else. We used to get the paper every day. Now we only get it on Sundays. Um, you know, add that up times how many millions of people. So they're not selling as many newspapers, not needing as many photographers, um, and the money's not there. And people have gotten used to kind of that instant, you know, I actually, I have, a, I have my TweetDeck open or Hootsuite open, you know, on the other monitor pretty much all during the day. And when everything happened in uh, the shooting in LAX airport last week, mm -hmm. I saw people I know right away sending pictures and everything right through Twitter. And, I, and then I curiously, immediately as I saw that, I put up CNN and USA Today on another monitor. It took them almost 30, 40 minutes, which is still kind of amazing, really. But it took them that much longer to actually get something posted there as well. But right away, from a user standpoint, Images are online and people got their information, so we've become accustomed to that. So, are you are you saying so? Because I'm I'm looking at two things. So, looking at the article that Petapixel put up there, they're saying 50% of newspaper jobs have disappeared. Okay, which correlates to 50% of the circulation of newspapers has probably vanished as well, right? So it, it makes sense. I think it's a combination. I don't think it's just, you know, we, we're selling half the newspapers, we're getting rid of half of our staff. I think it's it's all of it. It's Instagram and Twitter and iPhone pics and Samsung pics and, it's, you know, all of it mixed right. in yeah. with lower sales and digital, yeah. I, I, think, I think you've also got to keep in mind that what consumers are demanding is not necessarily image-rich content anymore. Right. And, and that, that is a big complaint that comes out of um, uh, the photojournalist community themselves. And I, 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 I need to, how do I put this? The, the, the issue with it is that I think the, the editors in that making the decision are maybe not paying as much attention to what is really what consumers are really wanting and versus what the advertisers are looking for as well. I, I yeah. have this big dilemma with journalism at the moment in South Africa, in South Africa, but I think it's a global issue as well. Um, you know, we'll take, uh, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with um, Oscar Pistorius, who is the, the a double amputee South African runner in, mm -hmm. you know, ran mm -hmm. in the Olympics yeah, and the able-bodied races and that. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, he appears in court for something that everybody knows is going to be 15 minutes of appearance in court just to postpone a court case or whatever. We will get five or six days coverage out of that, um, you know, prior to, to the, th the thing happening. And we recently saw um, a story here where, uh, um, you know, he forgot to put on his iPhone. He can't, um, you know, be able to get into it and the police apparently made an appeal to Apple to engineers and they the Apple said they were going to send out engineers to come and take a look at the whole uh, scenario and see if they could open it up but then they've released their transparency report recently which says they've received no requests from South Africa um, for help on something like that now you know the, what essentially seems to have happened and, and there could be three different angles on the story but at one point a single news state um, provider published a story, not even South African based, that uh, police spokesmen had said they were approaching Apple. And everybody ampl amplified the story without going back and checking the facts and that um, and seeing if that really was the case. They just said, so and so said it and, and you know, here it is, this is, this is obviously news. Yeah, and the problem dangerous. with that yeah. is if, from a citizen and journalism point of view, you run the risk of doing that, of a news agency taking a story, it catches fire from somebody who's got a bit of a following and and it's not genuine. And I think that is one of the issues you sit with. Um, and, and we focus hugely on celebrity news. In I think there is a market, it may be a small market, but it's a very loyal market that is interested in a documentary style approach to news and to photography. And I think there is space in the market for someone to say, and, and we've looked at it and considered, I just simply don't have time on my plate. So if somebody wants to take this idea, I'll take 15% of it and, and we can call it a day. But um, essentially, 
you know, I think there is a place for people that are prepared to to publish the stories that photographers are passionate about and investing their time in, and that you know focuses on hard news um, and invest uh, and true investigative journalism, um, and and that. You know, it may be a niche market, but I think there's a growing, um, it is a growing market of people who are concerned about that kind of story. And but if, yes, but if you there do that, is. But if you do that, Tristan, so like you were saying earlier, uh, don't expect a giant payday at the end of the at the end of the week or, right. or month. Correct. I exactly, and that's why I say it's it's for those people who are really passionate about telling stories. That you've got to be prepared to live off of, um, you know, your your kind of crackers and cheese at the end of the month if you're lucky enough to get the cheese. Um, but there will come a point where you will get the recognition and that that you need. And here's the thing is you do it, you focus, you build your brand around what you do and there are other opportunities for revenue and I think that's what photojournalists need to look at. The problem is when you're employed by a paper and you're shooting full time for the paper, certainly in South Africa, there's huge copyright issues. You're being commissioned by the paper and in South Africa, copyright belongs to the person who commissions you um, and, and that's where the issue Issue comes in also for the industry. So I think to be a freelancer um, is probably the most uh, is the most le least restrictive option. But yeah, you're going to work a lot harder to be able to make a living out of that. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. You know, Frederick too, and and part of it, you know, news is so diluted. There's so many sources now too. Right. Think about it between all the websites and all the news sites, and you know, we watch. Anytime anything happens, you turn on any of the news TV channels and they talk about it for days and days and days, like you were saying, because honestly, I don't think they have enough content. There's 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 right. too much going on. And yeah, there's a, I think there's agendas behind all of it. It's a lot different. You might remember I went to school initially as a photojournalism major, ended up in broadcast journalism, and then just minored in photo. And it was a whole different world back then. I mean, there was just a few channels and, and cable and... Um, there was there was uh, I think it was City News in Chicago and everybody wanted to go and work and learn from them and uh, you know all the, it's a whole different world today so yeah yeah it's distributed right I mean it's I don't know maybe right. maybe distributed isn't the right word but it's democratized across several diluted. different ways that you can pull your news in right so it's not just you know we all go to the to the trough at the same time every day to get our daily helping of what happened in the world we can we can know what happened by the minute, like you were saying about the, the LAX TSA shooting, right? So when that happened, you knew about it because people right. you knew were tweeting about it and they were down there, so why would you care about a news agency? But you know, but what? But years ago, people would put on the news, they, you know, their favorite news station based on, let's say, the anchors on television, right? Mm -hmm. Today, people are putting on based on their political preference. So you've got the right wing turning on Fox News. you got the left wing turning on MSNBC. You know, you've got those that don't really yeah, care too much, they turn on CNN. Yeah. And the numbers for each of those, if you I look, turn on Comedy Central, by the way. I don't <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's where I get I my news, the Daily Show. <laughs> But, uh, you know, that's driving a lot of it, too. Yeah. And uh, it's just it's a lot different than when I was uh, taking my mass media law and ethics class in college. Yeah. yeah. The and, you know, which gets me to another, which is more of a pet peeve, but these news anchors and, and putting their opinions in on stories, mm. yeah. which I see all the time. <laughs> Yeah, like yeah. It's that. not journalism. That's that's an opinion it's exactly, editorial yeah, so piece. Yeah, things have shifted a lot in all in all respects. It's crazy. It's crazy talk. But hey, you know, it's it's maybe it's quote unquote progress. All right, guys. Well, speaking <laughs> speaking of progress, how'd you like that segue? Look at that. That's speaking really good. Very good. <laughs> speaking of progress, um, one of the key stories that I wanted to talk about on this episode was um, Apple and Google and. They have, and I wanted to just shine a light on their two distinct visions for the future of photography in general. So on the i on the Apple side, you know, of course things are centered around the iPhone. You know, it's an iPhone. It can store. You can shoot all these awesome images as the best camera on you know arguably any mobile device out there. Um, but they're criticized a lot. You know, and of course they've got Mavericks that they just released, the, the next version of of um, OS X. Uh, with I'm reading from the spec sheet over 200 new features and you know it's just 
a big update, you know, which then they flicked the switch and gave it away to everyone for free, which is Brilliant. crazy talk, right? So, so they did really? that. And then, of course, iOS 7's out, which is the biggest visual design since Apple introduced the, the iOS in, um, what was it, 2007. Biggest flop. And this week, they Sorry. pushed out the iPad mini with the retina display, <laughs> right? It just goes on and on. And then Aperture 4, right? So there's rumor that Aperture 4 is coming. Yeah. So we'll see if uh, Apple's gonna kind of blow the dust off of Aperture Four and, and put it <laughs> put it out, literally. In, yeah, literally put it out into the world. But all this stuff is sort of adding up to uh, what I call sort of a it's a computer or local hardware centric vision of photography. And then you look at Google. So Google's moving, placing their bets on the cloud model. So they've got mail, they've got images, they've got your documents, they've got videos, they've got Google Plus for social. Um, and which in Google Plus they've recently enhanced Google Plus Photos to do computational photography and automatic organizing and storing and all this stuff all in the cloud. So mm. on the computer local versus in the cloud. That's what I want to talk about on this episode of This Week of Photos. So, <laughs> so Dan, so Dan, you yeah. first. Looking at those two distinct methods, and I know I, I recognize that it doesn't have to be an or, it could be an and, right, and you right. can move them both together, but looking at it from through that lens, what do you think? I mean, if you know, you as a professional studio, brick and mortar studio owner, <laughs> which of these models appeals to you? Honestly, it is both, um, because I'm working on the road a lot consulting, or speaking somewhere, or I'll just want to work from home, or something else. Um, Let's take Google for instance. Yeah. Now I've been using Google Chrome a lot. All my bookmarks are syncing. Just on any device, I got the same bookmarks. Um, and putting documents, but see, that's not you know Apple at the same time is doing more cloud because all this new release uh, is is doing a lot more with iCloud. Right. Right. So my pages documents are now syncing yeah. and uh, Photo Stream, right? So you and Photo Stream, yeah, which which we're using because I think. Apple's taking the best of what you know Google's trying to do, but also locally because of computers, um, because everything now pushes over. We've got Apple TVs everywhere, so we literally push wirelessly. When I do training here in the studio, I no longer have an HDMI cable running through the wall. Push the laptop over wirelessly. Our dual monitors here, I've got docs and icons on both now, um, but my pages and numbers and anything else I want, my notes... Um, the, the text editor, which I use often, that's all cloud-based as well with Apple. Um, so I kind of like it. But at the same time, you know, I still, <laughs> I'm still old school. I still burn disks and, you, you know, do my hard drive disks? backups and everything else. What? Oh, yeah. What? Yeah, I do. <laughs> Have you heard that? of Dropbox? I don't know. I put them in fine <laughs> folders, yeah. I don't you, you know, know what, Dan, I can't I even know. play. I can't even play a disk. Let me see. Do I have that drive? I had to buy... <laughs> yeah, here it is. Look at this. I had to go to drive. Amazon and buy this I optical know. drive because it was like I don't know, fifteen bucks, twenty bucks. Because someone well, sent me an optical disc and I couldn't use it, so I <laughs> had to go buy a drive. <laughs> but see, every client gets a folder, and then we, we put uh, a disc in there. And wow. you heard PDF. I'm just saying. It's, I'm I, hey, I'm old school. What can I say? Well, you know, <laughs> it's like, have a in my day we use folders and we loved it. Well. It's, it's actually a little bit more, you know, my own stuff for documents and things, it's cloud-based. But when it comes to that stuff, you know, you're talking four or five gigs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know. So, yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a big deal. But but still, come on. <laughs> yeah, but uh, no, I think you got to just have control over it. You know, um, the online backups, you know, like Carbonite and things like that, I was using for a while, but with, I don't know, three, four Drobo drives that... You know, a terabyte or two. Yeah, it can't. I can't upload that stuff. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You could. It would just take you. You know, you're, you're probably creating I tried. more data. It took three years. No, no, no. I had Carbonite for three years. It never fully uploaded. <laughs> oh, <geez>. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that I thought we had it bad. <laughs> <laughs> that is. That's just bad. Okay. But uh, but but honestly, for for documents and stuff, I actually really do like have the uh, the cloud syncing. Um, but then there's you know, I know there there's people that are all worried about you know they know everything and all your stuff's out there and oh, wow. you know well that's the uh, other thing see that's the other piece of it so on the apple side yeah you could have the nothing's private let's face it right so right. this is a semblance of privacy of you having it on your local computer and all that if somebody wants it they could get it right but on right. the on the google side with the cloud based approach the the fear or the re irrational fear 
um, would be, oh, crap, Google is evil, and they're trying to aggregate all of my information, and then one day they're, they're going to turn evil and then use it against me yeah, or well, something like that, you know? Uh, it'll be long I gone know. before Tristan, that happens. I, 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 think I don't see that Go ahead, Tristan. I, I think Google, what Google's doing though is very clever because obviously they're trying to get traction for Google Plus, yeah. and one of the biggest reasons for having social media is to be able to share your family moments and your pictures and that with people. Um, and so, although uh, uh, there's as many people that use it just to rant, but um, I think the, the the thing about it is that uh, what they're trying to do is make it very very easy to literally you you take some photographs, you pick up your phone. And uh, there's a notification if you're on Android to say, you know, these pictures are up on Google Plus already. Would you like to make them public or would you like to share them with someone in particular? And that is very clever because it makes it that it just removes one or two extra steps from the process of getting those pictures out there. The only problem is now getting your family onto Google Plus. <laughs> so yeah. it's it's a you know, but I think the the approach that they're having is is an interesting one in being able to streamline that process. Yeah. Um, and and the benefit of it is. I've always got a backup of my images online with Google Plus. Um, they may be low res, you know, versions of it, but at least I know that all the pictures. Because let's face it, the the you know the auto uploading on on an Android device. Um, you know, I'm mostly taking pictures of my kids and stuff like, and family moments with that, and and those are things which I don't want to lose. And if my phone gets stolen or you know whatever the case is, at least I know that those pictures I've got a copy of them and those memories are mm -hmm. still there. So yeah. I think it's a very interesting approach that they've taken, um, you know, in that regard. But I don't I don't think you can. It is a case of having either or. You you you're gonna use a combination of both That's systems. Um, yeah, but it's either or. But if you look at it, look at it from the from the Google standpoint, right? So, like we said, they've got Google Plus, which is their social network that they're mm. integrating into the Google network more and more as the day goes, days go by. Then there's Google Photos, which has that the sort of automatic sorting and computational photography stuff in there, and the auto awesome, all that stuff is in there. And then Snapseed, which they just acquired, which brings sort of high end editing or sort of high-end editing into online mobile apps. And there's Google Glass that, you know, we'll see it's controversial, but it's still out there and it's going to, you know, I don't think it's going to stop. Google's going to launch it no. probably next year. And that will allow people to take pictures and video and upload them automatically from wherever they are, sort of point, of point of view. And then there's Android, right, which is the giant competitor to iOS on the Apple side. So all these things sort of work together on the Google side to sort of create this utopian vision of pixels in the sky. And then I look at it from the standpoint of, you know, this is, it's almost like if you look at Adobe, Adobe's conspicuously missing from all this, right? So you look at Adobe and it's sort of like Photoshop elements in the cloud, what Google is doing and going after that audience. I don't know. What do you guys think? That's I th what I, I do find very interesting is, I mean, Google are, are definitely making a strong play to, to challenge. I think there's been this perception for a long time, and, and a part of it is valid that, um, you know, I, iPad was the preferred tablet for photographers. You know, it had the better photo editing applications, and that um, what they, uh, what Google are doing with Android uh, KitKat um, and the non-destructive photo editing that's now in default in Android KitKat, I think right. is is a fantastic move on their part. Yeah. Um, Snapseed for me is kind of replaced Lightroom. That's you know, I get. Having an NEX6, I copy over the pictures I want. I run through them quickly in Snapseed, and I, I, I you know, share them uh, immediately to the blog or, or, you know, onto whatever social profiles that I want. So I, I do think they're making a strong play for that. But I, I think, you know, the interesting thing is Google actually have been planning this for some time. I think if you look at it, the the, the main piece of software I still use on my desktop to be able to sort my images and and particularly for the its facial recognition is Google Picasso. Mm, it's free yeah. and it works really, really well for that kind of stuff. So I think it is an interesting move, but I mean, at the same time, what Apple's doing is is fantastic as well. And I've been a PC user for the longest time, um, and I've just ordered a, a MacBook Air because of Mavericks and the ecosystem that it offers. I'm 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 still not sure that I'm going to give up my Note 3 for an iPhone. The screen is a little bit small. Mm -hmm. um, but you know that that's the the thing about it is the the ecosystem that Apple's creating 
um, if as long as you want to live within their ecosystem is fantastic and it works exceptionally well. The advantage that Google's offering is the ability to use it across multiple manufacturers and devices. Um, and I think that that's the advantage of the cloud-based system is you can switch between platforms is that, um, fairly so that's, easily. I think that's that's a good point you bring up, Tristan, because that's, that's an advantage. So advantage Google on that side of being more open than Apple. But I would argue in some ways it's also a disadvantage advantage right when it comes to um, upgrading the OS for example so on on the iPhone mm -hmm. side Apple says you know all hail we are releasing <laughs> iOS 7 <laughs> and boom everyone gets iOS 7 you know there's a thunderclap and iPhones update across the planet on the Google side it's a little bit more complicated than that because we've got a matrix now of iOS devices, some of them that can and can't run the, uh, the yeah. new update, and when do you get it? And some people are like, "Hey, I just bought this phone. How do I get KitKat?" You know that kind of thing. Right? Agreed. I, I think there's been a lot of uh, debate online over the last uh, two or so weeks about um, you know Google moving away from uh, yes, Android is open, but it's not fair to necessarily call it open source in that, yes, the default code is there, but they've become very restrictive in terms of things that you can and can't do to make use of the Google Play services and the maps and, and stuff like that. But at the same time, uh, you know, what the developers are criticizing is Google keeps spinning off core functionality from Android as apps. So Gmail, which used to be built into Android in the early days, is now a separate app. Um, yeah. The keyboard in Android is now a separate app. The gallery application now with photos becomes, you know, kind of redundant. Um, but what Google's actually doing in a way is, is a very interesting take, which I hadn't thought about before by doing this, was that they allowing people to enjoy the benefits of the the KitKat updates to those applications because they now standalone applications. So I don't have to wait for Samsung to finally give me KitKat on on my my new device, which you know um, I've only had for a few weeks, um, and to be able to enjoy some of those benefits because they now standalone applications. So yeah. and, yes, and they're trying to as well, right? Uh, it makes them it gives them more flexibility. So you have the core OS, and you can instead of refreshing the entire operating system, and you have to wait for an entire operating system refresh. They can the, so you can say, hey, the, let's you know the keyboard team has made some awesome enhancements to the keyboard, and we're just going to deliver that. Boom. So now you exactly. have a new keyboard, or you can choose to have a new keyboard, or you can choose to have a new Photos app or SMS app or whatever, which I think that's really smart. That is really smart I, to do it I that think way. It's, and I think that that's the advantage. So that's their way of trying to you know, circumnavigate the, the, the operators not living within the, the, the guidelines or pushing out stuff as quickly as we'd like. Um, so I agree that, that from the perspective that iOS gives you those updates, um, that that's fantastic, and I I think th that's the thing that appeals to me is um, the ecosystem and and the seamless integration or the increasing integration between it. You know, being able to look at a place on Maps on Mavericks and be able to navigate it to, uh, to it from your iPad or your iPhone. That kind of stuff is is fantastic. Yeah. Um, you know, from a photo perspective, though, one of the big Disadvantages that I have with with Apple um, is your iCloud storage is still extremely small in comparison to what you get um, from Google as a free service. I mean, Google's practically giving you half of what the maximum paid service is, I think, on on iCloud, um, and you can still pay Google for more. So, mm -hmm. you know, th that that's that's the the the, the thing about it. Um, Apple, if they want to compete in that cloud space, need to do a lot more because think about it: 50 gigs of iCloud storage, you can fill that up pretty quick. Um, you know, with your uh, uh, with, with photographs in particular. So absolutely, Dan, uh, are you are you afraid of the big bad Google and cloud computing? No, no not at all. I I, <clears throat> I actually, you know, I'm 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 a technology head, so I, I love all of it. And mm -hmm. you know, when you think about a hard drive in your computer and local things and your hard drive crashing, it seems very antiquated now. The way the world is. But there's still that many of us that need to work that way. Um, there's, on one hand, you can't always be online. You know, that's, you know, all of this stuff re requires everybody to be online. There's sometimes, you know, we're not quite there yet. Um, I think what Google's doing is very forward-thinking because, like, our high school, none of the kids really use laptops 
they're all using iPads and things because they're using Google Docs. Yeah. Yeah. And so everybody can work work with it. Um, however, I was just reading today. It's funny this came up because um, Best Buy yanks HP Chromebook 11 off of store shelves. Hmm. Saw that come Why? out today. Why? So, you know, for people who don't know, the Chromebook was really just you know, a portal to, you know, the online Google world. Sure. Um, and I don't think people understood it yet because they're used to this hard drive driven, you know, here's my computer or here's my tablet. Mm. So that bridge, that Chromebook was what that was. Um, I don't think we're quite there yet. So for now, I think the world is going to be this in this transition of this cloud-based computing, getting people past the fear that, you know, it's all spies looking at our yeah, stuff. Yeah, and I'll, I'll tell you, I'm um, close to it because, like I was, I alluded to earlier, I'm I'm working on a MacBook Pro here, which doesn't have an optical drive in it, and I mean, there, even yeah. Twip, right? So we're recording this through Google Hangouts, so it's right. going it's going to YouTube. It's all cloud based, right? Even our docs are in Google Docs, so we're all working from a Google document. We're all sharing the document. Right. We can all see it right now as we're recording the show. It's all in the cloud, right? Yeah, which is great because we can make notes on it and we're all seeing it. Yeah, um, yeah. But the scary thing is, uh, and I'll tell you, there's always a double-edged sword, right? So the scary thing is if for some reason, like, it fails on the server side, we right. don't have a show, or... Our if, internet goes down. We, I was going to say that, yeah. I'm using Comcast, which, you know, hopefully they don't go down during the show. <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's points of failure. <laughs> Yeah, there's points of failure that are here that aren't present if we were, say, recording locally, you know. But then again, as I think through that, if we were recording locally, you guys would still be in South Africa and Chicago land area. <laughs> you would still need the Internet exactly. to do the show. But, you know, still, I would be recording the file. I wouldn't have to worry about it going away. Well, so. you know, you know, I try, when all this has happened, I still think about the early days of my computer animation career and installing one megabyte at a time on a stack of floppy disks. <laughs> install software. 640K! Yeah, and so now to actually, it still kind of amazes me when I click the App Store and, yeah, I like that, and hit a button and you buy it and it's downloaded and you're running it. Yeah. And it's really kind of nice, even with this crappy 703 update that the iPhone let out that's killing my battery every two minutes. Uh-oh. Um, Should I not update? <laughs> two hours. Literally in two hours, it, it, I, it it's dead. And uh, there was a news story on it, too. Oh, <laughs> but um, what's kind of nice, though, is that the three times I've had to reformat my phone, I don't worry about anything because my contacts okay. just come right back down. All my emails, IMAP server, um, any of my notes, they're, they're all cloud-based, so I log in and I got my notes again. So I'm not losing anything. My photos, you know, like Tristan said, they're all on the cloud. Um, so long so as your connection allows you to download it. That's, as long that's as your connection allows you to download which <laughs> it's not, not too hard in Chicago, but... Uh, other yeah. places in the world, it is. Yeah. So I, I think that's the, the 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 difficulty some of these companies are facing. Though is they they starting increasingly they are catering for um, first world markets, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but um, you know, Google has a very strong reputation in certain emerging markets, but it, their services are only as good as you're able to access them, and mm -hmm. that that is becoming it is still an issue in many markets and. Those are markets that these companies need to start looking at growing into because that is, you know, certainly in the photography we've seen it, it's the next frontier for a lot of, of these companies. I mean, Samsung set up regional headquarters for the continent here in, in South Africa. Fuji took away the distribution and, and, and are running the whole operation themselves now. Um, you know, emerging markets is where these companies are going to make their next growth. Mm -hmm. um, and if you don't focus on it, you can be the next BlackBerry. Um, you know, that's that's really you what a black buried yeah yeah exactly i mean and, and i mean we're talking about a company which had you know about a, just over two years ago probably 80 percent of the smartphone market on in emerging markets and today they don't have it um that's you know because that's yeah you know they just didn't focus on it and they were losing on on their core market their all the their first world markets as well so i think that that's you know, for all of the cloud and functionality and that, I got a new, I got an iPad Mini recently, um, and I tried to restore my backup from the previous iPad Mini I'd had about you know eight months ago, and it just would not restore. Um, you know, it, it eventually I literally had to set it up as a new iPad because I just could not bring down the the, the, the backup from the cloud. So was it a was it, it a bandwidth issue or was it something else? Bandwidth issue. Yeah, it just I mean the the download speeds are not 
consistent and the consistent ones are extremely slow. I mean, see, we get we get one meg download. That's essentially what that's we get. That's crazy. See that? See that's that's the Achilles heel of all this. And I hit that when I travel, right? Because I have, like I'm saying, I've got a lot of like we do TWIP in the cloud. I've got a lot of documents in Google Docs. I've, of course, I can bring them down locally on the computer if I remember. But I can do that. And then there's music and entertainment. So Netflix, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> I'm watching movies on Netflix. Spotify, my music is in Spotify. So it's like if the cloud goes away, I'm sort of like a ship without oars, you know, <laughs> for, exactly. for a little and while. That, that, and how do you, you know, and as a photographer, if your images are stored in the cloud and that's how you're displaying them on your iPad, say they're in, you know, SmugMug is your cloud and all your images yeah. on SmugMug and you go to a client to show them, you know, this is what I do. I'm sorry, I can't connect because we don't right. have a connection. That's why I'm not 100% comfortable with everything up there yet. You know, I want some control. I even have, I, it's kind of funny you mentioned it, I've got this original iPod over here. Wow. <laughs> um, but you know what I, you know what I'm doing with this? My car has, um, you know, I can plug a USB drive into it, right? Yeah, yeah. This is a 60 gig iPod, the very first one that came out with uh, the video. Yeah, yeah Probably, I remember I know, those. I have one of those. And it still works, and I plugged it in t just tonight. It downloaded new software for me, synced up all my music. So I got a 60 gig drive in the car plugged in. Oh, that's cool. You were using this whole iPod. So. I should totally try that. I didn't even think about that. It's Mine's in a box. In this drawer, just absolutely useless. I'm like, wait, that's a huge drive on there. So um, it's I still nice have to have my original. I have the original iPod, the white one with the, with oh, the, the mechanical is... click wheel on it. Remember those? I have that yeah. one. This is the black one with the video. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Look at that. But you know, my point is, it's good to have things local. Sometimes I don't think I don't think anybody's a hundred percent ready. Google Docs is just great. You know, syncing the photos in the cloud so we don't lose them, contacts and things like that. But um, especially working across multiple devices and sharing. But I just, for me, you know, it's different. You know, like millennials and people coming up now, they're used to this. All right, we came up from. Think about it. Um, Little bit of little bit of eight track tape. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I miss that, tapes, but yeah. <laughs> CDs. You know, our generation, all three of us, we came up through this whole digital age, to the point where Apple almost didn't exist, and everything else to the invention of the iPod. So, I think for our generation, we're still kind of used to that. And I'm not saying we're not um, forward thinking or embracing this new technology. There's just some security in in having something local and, and owning it and not being entirely reliant on the cloud. Yeah, yeah, no, very, very well said. So where where is this stuff going, guys? So where in the next five years or so, what are we gonna, what what's the world gonna look like? If it looks A like lot this more now, augmented reality. Especially, you know, you look back look back five years and see where we were five years ago and where we are now, then extrapolate that forward five years. What do you, you what does it look like? You can't because. It's been said, and, and I remember somebody had told my dad this years ago when they got a fax machine and it would take 20 minutes to send a page across the U.S. Doesn't that cool? And uh, <laughs> and it's awesome. <laughs> and uh, but they said there are things in 10 years that will be invented that you can't even possibly imagine. Right. And I still believe that that in five years, I saw something today on that MIT invented, and so they have like a 23 inch monitor. All right, with a person sitting there, and th there's sensors. This table, kind of like um, kind of like a light box, you know, photograph that you would photograph on. Yeah. You know, but when they put their device or their hands there, it would respond on the other side through the internet, of course, through the internet's on the line. And <laughs> they had, uh, you know, those pins that come out that you would like put on your face and make those little um, boxes of pins and yeah. you put your hand in. Right, right, right. Yeah, make the form. It was like that, but they were they were little cubes. I'll send you the link. They were little cubes. And so whatever he was doing on this side, those sensors translated on the other side. So he had they had a flashlight, for instance, on this set of cubes. He reached into his, I'll put my hands up, reached into his sensor area, and then the cubes responded on the other side, and he was actually moving that device on the other side, wherever oh, it was. Wow. And I'll sh I'll send you a link and we'll we'll post it because it was just amazing and it's so it's it's now just not just syncing your clouds you're actually putting motions through you know using the internet and this augmented reality um, which is what Google Glass the Oculus Rift this is where things are going and there's companies I work with on a 3D side that is getting more into 
these types of presentations for people, uh, interactive marketing, making things more engaged for people because it's just that, that I guarantee that's that's where you're going to start seeing things go more. Where um, what was the Tom Cruise movie with the Minority Report? Minority Report. You're going to see a lot more of that stuff with data coming out at you and you know all those future things. Right. The funny thing is in movies when they do little holograms. All this amazing technology they can do, like flying cars. How come the holograms always like, eh, eh, and they can't seem to keep a steady? <laughs> they can't picture? do a, They can't do an HD it. or 4K hologram yet, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I Tristan, think Tristan, what about you? What's your, what's your prediction for the future, what, or the future of photography in particular? What are we gonna see? I think we're going to find it continually more integrated into our lives. I think um, I look at Google Glass and yeah, there, there are some issues I have around security. I, I don't want to be in the gym with some guy walking around with Google Glass necessarily. Um, <laughs> unless that guy's me, maybe. I don't know. What, what do you I got to hide, Kristen? What are, what are you hiding? Come on. <laughs> I don't want to see. <laughs> well, you know, this, this large six pack over here. Oh, wait, no, that's a keg. Um, <laughs> but it's. Uh, I, I think uh, you know the the thing for me was um, the the advantages of Google Glass in a in an environment where, for example, you're playing with the kids or you're working with the kids or you know being able to take a picture and not having to use your hands. I think we're going to see a lot more of that kind of stuff moving into the into the future. Um, I think it's it's. It, it's all going to be connected based, no questions about it. Um, and I think that's the biggest thing is, is getting that kind of connectivity going. Um, I was uh, chatting to someone who just came back from Tokyo on a, on a thing that Ericsson sent them to, to see what living in a connected city and that's like. And he's like, the entire time he was there, he did not lose connectivity once. Um, moving on the train at however many hundred million k's an hour, you know, he still was able to, to get connectivity. Um, and I think that as that becomes um, you know, more and more available in cities, we will be able to have those kind of experiences um, that Dan was talking about. And uh, I, I, I kind of enjoy the, 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 you know, the possibility of walking along and seeing you know, what... Imagine if you had connectivity out in, in a monument area, for example. You're walking you know, around exploring the place and pictures that you've shot, Frederick, and that Dan have taken of that place at different times of the day come up and you can see what the photographic potential is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. gee, I need to come back here at 6 o'clock. I need to, that's, that's when the light's going to be at its best or whatever. I think that is going to be um, a large part of, of what we see in the future. And it's all going to be tools that we can utilize to our benefit. We're going to sacrifice a little bit of security. We, we mm -hmm. you know, there's always that risk that uh, Adobe gets hacked and, oh, wait, that did happen. That happened. Um, that happened. <laughs> so, you know, and, and you've got to go and change your passwords everywhere. But, yeah. but I mean, you know, that that's the, the reality is that, um, you know, we, that, there's that risk that you run, but the, the, the benefit of it, the ability to be able to share and emerge yourself, immerse yourself in, in that kind of, um, Visual experience, I think, will be fantastic. Awesome, lots of lots of food for thought, guys. All right, uh, before we continue into this week's listener Q and A segment, I want to thank another one of our sponsors for this episode, and that's Squarespace. All right, gents, it is time for our listener Q and A segment. This is where you guys get to answer questions that uh, some of our listeners have posed to you and the question for this week is from John Decker He's, and he posted this in our TWIP Google Plus community page. He says in the past couple of months I photographed a couple of large outdoor event groups and have lucked out with the lighting. It's been sunny with cloud cover offering good light diffusion without the need to artificially add light. I just turned down a potential client because their request to shoot a group shot of their sports team indoors made me question my lighting kit's capabilities. Got four Canon speed lights with soft boxes. And his question is, how can I best prepare for indoor lighting of a large group? And he's like, what was I wrong turning them down? He's feeling extra uncertain about this. Dan, I'm sure you've yeah. done this once or twice. Yeah, absolutely. What, what do you um, think? All right, well, I want to talk about outside a little bit too because I don't like flash outside. Um, you know, if you're bringing a strobe or something, it's one thing, but I'm just, I'm just not a big fan of the look of those hot speed lights outside. Mm -hmm. And what we've done, we actually have one family, great family came, uh, six kids, two parents, 
only time they could do it with so many people and coordinating schedules was Saturday, 1 p.m., July, midday, and they came wearing white, which <laughs> initially I didn't... You know, <laughs> and it was an African-American family too, right? <laughs> so here's how I did it. I bracketed the shots and exposed initially for their faces, um, did a five bracket on a D3, <laughs> and then sure enough, we were fine. So I had an exposure for the face, exposure for the shirts, one for the sky, but no time you'd at all portrait, to blend it you'd together. Portrait HDR then. Pretty much, yeah, yeah. Without that HDR look, just yeah. blended different exposures together. Um, for inside, in this case, um, what I would do because the only problem I see ins it to wear inside. It could be, you know, you could very easily have a door that you'd open as a light, bring a reflector or a window, depending on how large it is. We did a large group in an office, yeah. um, and we did bring a big softbox. Uh, we were doing a calendar for them. But then they needed a group shot, and this big group shot, we went out to the warehouse, we opened the big door. I did have a speed light, but I used that more as a backlight, kind of like kind of like my, my little desk lamp is back there. And it just shot a big light behind them, which actually looked kind of cool and created some depth. Yeah. Um, from that, I just made sure I was exposed to their faces, and then of course, it's shot raw, so I massaged it a little bit in the computer after. But, you know, if you can see the environment and there's some natural light, you can simply just work with reflectors by a little simple reflector stand. If you can't afford that, get a board and wrap some tin foil on it and just stand it up, have somebody hold it, and you can bounce enough light. Um, I shot inside at a um, for the school recently, 3200 ISO. Looked great. Tiny little bit of noise reduction. Uh, just using available light. So as long as it's not those orange gym gymnasium lights, yeah. um, which well, you can then color band. He said, this listener said um, it's a sports team. So my knee-jerk reaction is it's in a gym, right? All right. So, so we'll then what you get, and I don't have one in, in the room here, but they have a soft box. I have one. It goes on my speed light. And those speed lights are, you know, really powerful. Yeah. And while you can't get really creative lighting, with something, you know, with just one of those, you can very easily fill in the faces and then you won't get that that raccoon eye from those orange, you know, gymnasium lights. So yeah. just bring one speed light, get a little modifier for it, and then just blast it. Not straight on, but a little bit off to the side. A little reflector, it'll be fine. Nice, nice. Can Tristan, I, you can have I anything Dan, uh, I don't know if you guys saw the um, that launch. I'm not saying this is the solution for this particular question, but it it quite interested me that this question came at this time. I don't know if you guys saw the launch of the um, Pro Photo B1 uh, light uh, last week. I just week. saw that. Yes, yes I did see that. Yep. that. That is incredible. I got to play with one a little bit um, ahead of the announcement. Of it's course, amazing. You did. <laughs> it's amazing. Well, we'll tell for the people who don't I got know stuck into a little get, back no room. <laughs> what what is it, Tristan? For the folks that don't know what so, it is, what Proto Profit have done is they've taken essentially one of their studio lights and they've put a big lithium battery onto the side of it. Yeah. Um, and there are no cables attached to this thing. It works off of their radio slave. If you're on Canon, it supports ETTL with a new trigger that they've got. Nikon is said to follow within the next couple of months. Um, and and literally, you've just got this light with a, a place to get, hook it onto a stand if you want to. That's it. Uh, the battery can be swapped out if you need it to. It updates firmware via USB. But it's incredible. You literally have a studio light. You know, previously, if you were going to shoot on location, you'd be carrying a battery pack around right. and connecting your lights to this. This is like a giant speed light. You're getting the studio light, um, and it's got a... Uh, this battery connected in it, and you've got free motion to be able to move around and do whatever you want with it. It is absolutely incredible. And it's not but super big. It's like no, it's it's like, a it's, light, it's, right? it's like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's the size I think of their D1. I think it is. Is their their kind of base studio, their mo more popular light. Um, but literally with this built-in battery reason. pack, 500 watts of power. Yeah. Um, and at full power, you'll get about 220 shots off of a battery. Um, it's it's incredible what they've done with that. It's I think it's going to be for for Pro Photo, which in South Africa is a hugely expensive brand. I'm not saying it isn't elsewhere in the world, but it's you know you you can buy two Studio Light kits from another brand for the price of a, of a single Pro Photo Light. Yeah, that that is going to be quite incredible because they've literally halved the price of their location shooting system, and that just gives you you know all the flexibility of Studio Lights, but with the portability of being able to use it indoors, outdoors. Um, it's quite incredible. Definitely something worth checking out. And what was the, do you remember how much that thing cost? 
I don't know what the international pricing is. Here it's going to be about, uh, I think they were aiming for about 28,000 Rand, which would be the equivalent of about $2,800. I'm sure it's cheaper than that. We've got obviously duties and stuff like that that we've got to pay for here. It's about two but grand. Two grand? There we okay. go. So. Yeah. Hey, but it, hey it's going to be a light that you're going to use power. forever. Yeah. And All it's right. an LED modeling lamp too, which is kind of yeah. cool. Can use it right. for a little bit of video light if you yeah. need from time to time. Cool, well, cool. All right. Well, I think we answered John's question. Thanks, guys. All right. Next up is the picks of the week. Um, this is where you guys get to recommend something something to the uh, listening audience, as long as it's related to photography. Tristan, why don't you go first? What's your pick? Um, it's a good question. I, I thought I had would have one for today, but then my MacBook Air hasn't been delivered to me yet. <laughs> um, I, I did find a camera bag that could... So I've, I've been looking around knowing that I'm getting this MacBook Air. I was looking for a, a backpack that could take a 13-inch MacBook Air and a mirrorless camera system. I've got a think tank... Um, uh, of one of the Think Tank Airport series. It's the smallest one in their backpack range of that series, but it's still quite large. I mean, it can accommodate a 15-inch, and you put a, a mirrorless and any X camera in there, and it's bouncing up and down because it's just not deep. No, the bag's band? deeper than what the camera is. Did you say Think Tank? Uh, that, yeah, that was a Think Tank uh, Airport Essentials, if I remember correctly. Is the, is can the I recommend one. one for you? Yeah. Um, one I've used for years and years and years, um, and I've gone through like three of them. It's a Think Tank, but it's the, I think it's the Urban Disguise. Okay. So it looks like a laptop bag, and it's got room right. for your laptop. But I you can put a, a full that. digital SLR, two big lenses, but it still looks like you're carrying a laptop bag. I must I'm take looking a at look it at right that. now online. Okay, is it, they've got a bunch of them. There's Urban Disguise 50, 40, 30, 20, all the way down. Right. Those are, uh, yeah, little, little variations here and there, but it's cool because, listen, your laptop's still valuable. But it's those camera bags. When you're traveling, yes. people go, uh-huh, camera bag. Yeah, yeah that, that's... Uh, so it doesn't look like one, and it stores a lot, believe me. No, okay. Is that what you use, Dan? Is that your your bag? When, I, when I travel, yeah, absolutely. I, I have the 15-inch, uh, 40 or 50, whatever that is. Day-to-day, um, -day, I've got another one just for my laptop, but then when I travel, I take that, and I can carry... Yeah, right there. Very cool. That's yeah. it. Yeah, um, we're looking at it right now on the screen for you folks that are listening to this, and it, uh, yeah, definitely doesn't look like... A camera bag. Um, you can put take so much that. stuff in there. Yeah. Huh. Well, so check that out. then I, I'm going to check that out. Then, then in view of that, I'm going to make my pick of the week ridiculously expensive, and I'm going to pick the Sony Alpha 7. Oh, oh look at that. I, I'm busy I'm busy testing it at the moment. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I think, I think I'll, I'll pick the Sony Alpha 7 then as my pick of the week. And, so the A7, then, not the A7R. The, I, I haven't played much with the 7R, but uh, for me, the autofocus speed on the A7 is absolutely incredible. Nice. Um, you know, the, 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 I, I'm totally blown away by the speed of it. The funny thing is, about two years ago, um, as photo comment, we, we, we published an April Fools mm -hmm. about Sony launching a full-frame NEX7 that would get a battery grip and it would have this mount adapter to be able to use all the full alpha lenses. And it's scary how similar the A7 is to that. I still remember getting a phone call from someone at Sony and saying, who's been leaking this information to Did you? Did they really? You know, oh, that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and they're like, no, I mean, go look at the dates. You were supposed to announce this camera on like the 31st of February, you know, and and stuff like that. There were obvious signs that it was a... Uh, it was meant to be an April Fool's, and they reacted to it quite positively. Um, so, wow. and and now that it's here, it's um, I, I'm I'm enjoying it. I find the shutter buttons in the wrong place. It's a little bit too high up on the camera body, mm -hmm. but everything else about that camera is phenomenal in terms of the performance. It it exceeds my expectations. Now, will uh, you, for what will I you have be publishing a review about that? We will be doing so. It will be either in our January or February issue of the magazine. At the moment, I'm having to put two magazines to print before the 5th of December. I've got to get our December issue out uh, during the course of next week, um, and then our uh, our January issue before the print is closed on the 5th of December. So we, we still do print, Dan. You don't have to feel uh, like you're living too far in the past. <laughs> What's the model number? Uh, of the, uh, the, Sony. the Sony Alpha 7. 
looking. And looking yeah, Alpha 7. Cool. It's a fantastic machine. I'm enjoying it. I sadly have to take it back to them tomorrow. I've only had a few days to play with it. Um, hope to get some more time with it uh, later on in the month. But uh, that that would be my pick. It's it's pretty impressive, particularly when I compare it to some of the other cameras we've been reviewing at the moment. Um, it's quite fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic camera. Cool. That's cool. That's cool. All right. Um, so A7, well, well, that's your pick, and your MacBook Air if it ever shows up. <laughs> yes. I will not pick the couriers that are delivering my MacBook Air. That's for certain. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, don't get me started on couriers. Anyway. <laughs> All right, Dan, what is your pick of the week? Well, I'm not going to say Nikon DF now because he chose the... Uh... <laughs> The alphas. <laughs> but, Why not? Um, Go, ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. I wasn't even thinking about that. It was too obvious. Uh, <laughs> because, you know, I like the retro style, um, yeah. but given that I grew up with Canon from AE1 to A1, which I still have, but now I shoot Nikon, I, I feel like an imposter getting one of those, so I can't I can't shoot that. Um, <laughs> so my pick is called Picure. And I think that's what you say. P-I-C-C-U-R-E. And it's a cool little piece of software for Lightroom and Photoshop that reduces camera shake. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's kind of neat because, like, recently, you know, I've done a couple of long shoots, and I, I've got this lens, this, this you know, the, the uh, 70-200, to 200, uh, 2.8. And you yeah. put that on a D3, and you've been shooting a little while. You know, it gets a little heavy. And, and a little bit. Even with strobes, I've gotten just a little bit of blur because I've kind of, you know, I think they're going to be shipping. I, they're going to be shipping back braces with those cameras in the next. <laughs> and I'm anti tripod. Well, you so. can get an Alpha Seven, <laughs> or you exactly. can get a yeah, you can get Alpha Seven and uh, yeah. save a couple of your vertebrae. Yeah. So if you check out the software, look at the link. Um, it's a little piece of software that actually helps you know fix that That's little bit of blur where you look. Oh, I got a great shot, and then you get it in the computer and you look, and the eyes are out of focus because you just move the camera just a little bit. Uh, so it's perfect. To now, fix did you did you like test that. that? Does it actually does it actually work? Because I know some there's some, there's been some software out there that have claimed to fix blurry images, and it really doesn't. You know, just sort of like increase yeah, the one, contrast a little bit and call it a from, day. Yeah, for my little bit, it, it's working. Um, it's it's um it's camera shake. It's not blur. Okay. Mm. So there's a little it's bit different. Out of focus sight. pictures, Frederick. It's not going to fix out-of-focus pictures. No, we're going to wait for that next version of Photoshop to do that. Yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> which, which there was tech. Oh, which reminds me, um, I thought about this earlier and then I forgot. <laughs> when you were talking about images in the cloud and everybody sharing, there was a TED Talk a number of years ago um, where they were showing they would pick a location on a map and everybody's images in the cloud would would build together because they were they were all geotagged. This was before it got popular. Yeah. And it would geotag the images and suddenly build this huge image of, let's say, the London Bridge from everybody's different angles. See, that's cool. That's so I, I thought about that earlier. But yeah, so that's my pick of the week. Cool. All right. Peculiar. 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 All right. From Intelligent Imaging Solutions. Intelligent Imaging Solutions dot com. Definitely check that out. Okay, and my pick of the week is this guy right here. You guys see that? Oh. So this is from the folks that make the transporter, only it's like a transporter with his head cut off, but the idea with this thing is is you just take any old drive that you have, um, USB drive, and plug it into this thing, and it essentially becomes your Dropbox. So you plug your drive into the, the USB port, and then... Plug it into Ethernet, and Ooh. you're good to go. It just be how much storage some is power. There? What's that? How much storage? Nothing. So zero. Oh, oh you drive. You drive. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Got you it. plug your drive in, and whatever. So you have an old, say, you know, what, eight gig drive or whatever laying around. You plug that into this. Now you have eight gigs in the cloud that you can access from wherever you have an internet connection, just like Dropbox. I- that's cool. I've got a bunch sitting right here. Yep. There you go. So you get one of these for ninety nine bucks, and uh, you're Ooh. good to go. And we're, Fantastic. I think, I'm trying to get a discount code for these things from the transporter folks, but you'll have to look at the blog post at thisweekinphoto.com to get that. So we'll link to this, and I'll put the uh, the code, the discount code for it on the website if it comes through in time. For Does that have to be post. local? Uh, no, what do you mean, local? Well, let's say I plug a drive in at home with that thing, and it's on the home wireless, and yeah. I'm at work. Then can you I can get access it. it. Oh, that's cool. 
and you can share it. So you could say, yeah. this directory I want to share with Tristan, and this one I want to share with yeah. Frederick. Boom. Awesome. It just does the right thing. Yeah, that's it's great crazy. For group group collaboration. Exactly, exactly. I think this is awesome. This is because they did the transporter, which came with a drive in it, like a laptop drive, which was great. Mm -hmm. But and it was self-contained, so we do all that stuff. But it was it's a self-contained unit. Um, this thing, I think, takes it to a little bit more of a ubiquitous level in terms of anybody with a drive. Like Dan, you probably have a drawer full of drives. I do. That you could plug into this thing, and now you could use it for storage. That's <laughs> you know? cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's do you crazy. know if it works with the USB hub? If so, you could connect multiple drives to it, or not yet. I don't know. That's a good question. We'll or have to ask rate. those Stripe transporter folks. If you're watching this, you know, I think you should post a comment on the blog post. And our address, if you'd like to send one for us to test. <laughs> yes, we, <laughs> we need go. we need those to review. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, we need to we need to review this thing. Cool. All right, that's my pick of the week. Oh, price wise, uh, I, be I believe it's ninety nine bucks. So very nice. nice to know. All right. You, you double that by the time it gets to South Africa, but <laughs> exactly. it may still yeah, be worth it. Yeah, this will be like thousand dollars. <laughs> I, I think it's time to move our magazine to the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> Come on over, man. Come on over whenever you're ready. Awesome. All right, guys. Good show. Very good show. Um, and a reminder to the listeners: I mentioned this at the tease at the beginning of the show, um, but after the credits at the end of the show, I did an awesome interview, a little quick interview with the faux blographer, editor-in-chief, Mr. Chris Gampat. Awesome guy. We were hanging out in Nashville, Tennessee a couple of weeks ago, courtesy of Sony, because, Tristan, we were testing the A7 and the A7R. <laughs> Good for you. So, uh, yeah, so I agree with you on your comments there. Uh, but uh, he and I sat down in Nashville, right in the main hubbub area, in a noisy restaurant and bar thing, and did a quick interview. So I wanted to run that here. And there will also be a video of that on the blog post for this episode. So definitely check that out. All right, guys, we're at the end of another episode of This Week in Photo. Mr. Dan Ablin, where can people go to uh, connect with you and see uh, what you're up to? Way, it's about.me slash Dan Ablin, A-B-L-A-N, and that goes to all my sites. Love it. How easy is that? How yeah, easy is nice. that? One site to rule them all. I learned right. about that. I learned about that from TWIP. Yes, you did. A couple of years ago. Yeah. yeah. And what is mine? I think mine is about.me slash FVJ. About.me, F-V-J. I've, I tried to be clever and use my initials. So, so all right. Uh, Tristan Hall, where are you at? Uh, About.me forward slash Tristan D. Hall or photocomment.net is probably the, the best places to find me at. I'm working on my own personal blog at the moment, but I'm very seldom getting time to, to actually do anything there. So. Tell me. I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, and listeners, if you'd like to keep up with everything This Week in Photo related, be sure to check us out at thisweekinphoto.com, also where all the shows are hosted and the blog posts and videos and all that good stuff. Or you can also uh, join our community over on Google+. Plus. We'd love to connect with you there. And finally, if you're looking for me, Frederick Van Johnson, you can find me at frederickvan.com or on Google+, Plus at plus.google.com slash plus... Frederick Van. <laughs> <laughs> just doesn't sound right. Slash plus, plus Frederick Van. <laughs> All right. With that, it is time to take that lens cap off. <laughs> <laughs>